Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. Okay, we have been talking about APIs and seen some examples of APIs so far. So one thing that we would like to understand is, is there any way of sort of formalizing this? Meaning that is there a standardized way of specifying APIs that you know would make it easier for someone else who is new to the API to understand what it is that you're trying to do, right? Or even more usefully, is there some way that I can get a machine to do part of my work for me? Now, APIs that are of interest for web apps, as you saw, right, with the examples of Wikipedia and Covin and so on, they are, well, they're trying to do a certain form of information hiding, right? When I say information hiding, it's not that they're trying to hide what the contents of the information from the person. What they are trying to hide is how the information is stored, right? So the whether, you know, Wikipedia uses like a MySQL database or PostgreSQL or, you know, anything else at their backend versus, you know, some other completely new proprietary mechanism of their own, right, should not be the end user's concern. And as long as they have the API, they really don't know and they should not have to care, okay? So this information hiding is something that allows a client to use the server without knowing how the server is actually functioning. The server can also send back information to the client without bothering about whether it's a mobile device or whether it's a desktop or what it is. It just gives the information as requested, okay? So separation of concerns in some sense is a form of information hiding as well, right? And that's important for the development of web apps so that they don't break when something changes on one side or the other. And one important thing to keep in mind while thinking about this is that this is meant to be some kind of an unbreakable contract, right? That sounds very fancy, but what I mean is that the API should not change too easily, right? And in particular, let's say that, you know, you have built an app around Covin, which allows people to sort of log in, check various information and so on, and the Covin API changes, right? That means that your app stops working. You had nothing to do with it. You did not have control over the server and now suddenly you are stuck, right? Let's say you have built up a whole set of scripts to manage remote machines on the Google Cloud, right? You need to have something which allows you to bring up a machine programmatically, right? I mean, you just trigger an API which will automatically create a new VM. You need it because the kind of load that you are seeing is, you know, suddenly scaling up very uh, to very large numbers. Google has changed their API, your scripts break. There's nothing you can do, right? So that shouldn't happen. So that's why an API is expected to be standardized. That's why the version numbers are used, right? To sort of say that if I do need to break something, I will at least change the version number. I might retire the old version and tell people, look, you have some, you know, a few weeks or days or whatever it is within which to change. But at least you need to make it very clear that it's not, you know, the old scripts with the old version number should not be expected to work. Okay, so those are important things to keep in mind when you are designing an API. But then comes the question of documentation, right? How do I document such an API? And the problem with documentation is that it is highly subjective. Some programmers are very good at documentation, some are very poor at documentation, and some think documentation is a waste of time, right? Most people think documentation is a waste of time at some time or the other, right? Uh, that's not the way, in, yeah, you know, so do I. I don't document everything that I write. But on the other hand, it depends. If you are trying to build something which is going to be used by anyone else, not just you, you need to have at least a minimum amount of documentation or at least your code by itself should be clean enough to be able to understood. Okay. Now, documentation could also be incomplete, meaning that one programmer, the person who's writing the code might find that, oh yeah, you know, this is all self-evident. There's nothing really to document. I can't really add any useful comments over here. But the next person may wonder, hey, why is that parameter there? Why is it this variable being used in this fashion? It may not be obvious to another person looking at it. It may be outdated, which is a really unfortunately common situation, right? And the other issue, of course, is that documentation in general is human language specific. Right? So whatever documentation you might have in one particular language, let's say you are a Chinese speaker who doesn't have a good command on English, you are going to struggle with English language documentation, right? Can you translate it? Sure, right? Somebody could do the translation. 
now you are sort of potentially opening up more problems because the translation may not be perfect okay so documentation while necessary it would be good to see if there are other ways by which i could sort of have a more foolproof way of you know describing an api and one way of doing that is by means of something called description files okay and what we are saying over here is we are going to come up with some kind of a description which is a machine readable description it is structured it has a very specific sort of format right and when you just think about those terms that i have been saying like structured specific format and so on certain kinds of markup languages xml for example sounds just about perfect that is exactly what the language was designed for right to provide some kind of structure which basically says you know i can have i will have these tags i will have the corresponding closing tags within that i will have some other tags there are restrictions on what tags can be present in what places i this tag has a specific kind of meaning all of that information can be encoded nicely in markup languages like xml so sure xml can be you know it's it's something to keep in mind moving forward now not just that a description file enables automated processing meaning that if i have some kind of a markup like that some description file it may be possible to write a script which will just read that description and generate some boilerplate code for me it can actually generate what is called scaffolding right some standard parts of the script some minimal python code or html or uh, you know a combination of html python or maybe php or whatever other language you are using which says look i'm already creating all of these functions for you now just put the appropriate data inside or you know the code inside the functions you know code your logic in there so that it has the right things but for example let's say that you are doing a crud api right it will automatically create functions for index show edit delete and so on right and all that you need to do is just make sure that your code goes in there and you address the appropriate model for changes so an example of a description file or a description language is you know we are used to these we use them all the time right any programming language even something like assembly language is a version of the underlying programming language of a processor right the actual programming language of the processor is those instructions which are binary code right Mesh assembly language is basically a human readable form but it's not just that it's human readable it is also machine readable because it follows a very specific syntax similarly a c program is something that a human can read and understand but is also machine readable okay what we are talking about is not something that specific it need not be a programming language as such it just has to be structured enough that it can be read in by a machine and processed appropriately in particular just an english language specification is insufficient right because it still needs somebody to read that understand it and write code for it so with all of this in mind there is something called the open api specification oas right and this came about as something which is a new vendor neutral format for http based remote api specification okay so let's break that up we are talking about a specification right some way of describing remote apis something that happens over the web remotely between a client and a server it is also http based which means that it is sort of oriented primarily towards the web right and it is vendor neutral this is usually important for the simple reason that you don't want to get you know you generally we don't trust companies beyond a point right every company the bottom line is they need to have the, they need their product to succeed so there is always the chance that at some point they might say look we need to make a change which makes it better for our servers so rather than having that can we have a vendor neutral format that's why standards and specification standards exist right which are not controlled by any one company or organization or rather there might be an organization but the organization has to be seen to be neutral in some way okay now this oas is you know you they, they have a nice uh, very nicely descriptive web page it sort of gives the in background information about why the specification came up what is their motivation what are like examples that you can use to understand and so on 
One thing they make very clear is they don't aim to describe all possible APIs. And that's important because you know, you're not trying to, for example, describe Java APIs or C APIs. You are restricting yourself to HTTP based remote APIs, right? And they decided that let's focus on describing the common use cases for a web type application rather than everything that can be done for any kind of remote procedure call. This evolved from something called Swagger, which was developed by a company called SmartBear somewhere around 2015 or so. And the current OAS standard evolved from Swagger 2.0, right? And as of August 2021, we are at OAS 3, right? So OAS is the open API specification. OAS 3 is what is currently used as of August 2021. And you are likely to see this mentioned in various places as Swagger documentation, right? So Swagger simply because it originated from there and it is still very closely tied to that. So there are things like Swagger UI and various Swagger tools and so on, which work with OpenAPI to a large extent, okay? And uh, they are very useful tools and it's probably a good idea for you to understand how they work in, a different, in different contexts.